Thank you, Chris. Another round of applause for Chris and the team here at Clever Talks. All right, on your feet, stand up. Come on, stand up, shake it out. Get that energy flowing here. We're coming down the home stretch. A little story about the Chargers, L.A. Chargers. I'm still struggling with that one myself. All right, we'd do push-ups if Rudy was here, but he's somewhere off-site. All right, so please take a seat. So it's great to be here with other U.S. military veterans, including the Coast Guard. Who's here from the Coast Guard? We got Coast Guard. The smart people join the Coast Guard. All right, I've had the great pleasure to be part of the United States Marine Corps and some of the companies that you may recognize up on the board here. I'm most proud of my association with 511 Tactical. And if you're not wearing 511 Tactical pants, we'll get you. <laughs> if you are, thank you very much. I saw Jocko Willink, who's coming up later, rocking some of our new 511 Tactical pants. So I'm here today to give you a couple actionable ideas that you can take with you out there in the world of the first Civ Div, this shark tank in which we're all trying to operate. I've been in the shark tank for about 25 years since I got out of the Marine Corps. And I would say everything I've been able to do well in business, lucky or good, came from what I learned in the Marine Corps. So let's talk about some of the challenges we're dealing in business. Most people would say the hardest thing in business is maybe to come up with the capital or the idea for that new multi-billion dollar company, the next Facebook, Google. Maybe the hardest thing is to come up with that new product idea or breakthrough marketing campaign. Some people are going to say it's the day-to-day -day grind of hitting KPIs and hitting your metrics around customer service. I'm here to tell you, I think the hardest thing to do in business today is get the people on your team to care as much as you do. All right, an amen and a round of applause for that. And I've got data for you. I've got data for you. So let's see if I can crank a slide here. Oh, yeah, I was going the wrong way. So uh, you've heard of the Gallup organization. Every year, the Gallup organization surveys tens of thousands of employees at different companies in America, made in America. And uh, they ask them 12 simple questions. The questions are things like, do you have the tools to do your job? Have you gotten feedback in the last year? Do you have a friend at work? Do you know what's expected of you? That bar is really low. And based on the answers to those questions, we find the data says only 51% of people are not engaged. So half the people are not engaged. They're sleepwalking. These are people like, if you like The Office, for example, this would be Jim on The Office, right? So Jim and maybe Pam. I'm not sure anybody's really engaged in that TV show, The Office, but you know, these are people who are just waiting for the next break, waiting to go maybe get Black Rifle coffee in the break room, but they're just trying to get through the day. They really don't care. Worse yet, 16% say they are actively disengaged. This would be Dwight Schrute. This would be, you know, you're trying to take the hill, and this is the person saying, well, the boss is only here for herself or himself. You know, these are the people who are really against you. Now, there are about 10% of the people who really didn't weigh in, but the balance is about 23% of people who are fully engaged. These are the people when you come in, morning boss, how you doing? Today's gonna be a great day, let's get after it. Now I'm here to tell you if you're in a startup with only four people and you have an average group of folks around you, what does that mean about the other three? They don't care. If you're in a work group or a division of 100 people, right, you care, maybe 22 other people do, You've got the rest of the folks who don't really care. So this is a really big problem out here in the shark tank of first Civ Div. And I'll tell you what makes it worse. In case you haven't heard yet, in business, you have to make money. Right? Investors give you money. What do they want back? More money. So do you think investors care a lot about culture and mission and how good your product is? Maybe a little bit, but at the end of the day, what do investors and board members look at? The numbers. And guess what's easiest to measure in business? The numbers, right? So 
I'm going to tell you that you all have superpowers that you're not even aware of that you can combat these issues with. You have superpowers that I think over the next 10 minutes I'm going to help you understand and we're going to talk about how to use those superpowers. So let me frame up this problem in a little different light. Anybody here the uh, basketball coach UCLA, John Wooden, one of the winningest coaches ever? John Wooden has a, a couple of great books and all the books talk about the pyramid of success. I stole that idea. I use a pyramid, but my pyramid only has like three or four elements in it. I'm a Marine, remember, three or four elements, right? That's all I can remember. Crayons, short, monosyllabic words, edible crayons are better. Okay, so in a typical company, if you're the leader, you're the entrepreneur, you're the owner, maybe the CEO or president, and you need to make money, what do you spend most of your time talking about with your employees or your team? the base of that pyramid, you're talking about money, right? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, last week our revenue goal was X, we did 0.9X, here's our cost of goods, here's our gross margin dollars, here's OPEX, racketa, 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 racketa. You talk about money because that's the easiest thing to measure. Maybe then you talk about customers. You know, customers, they like us, maybe they don't love us. And by the way, yeah, we've got people. People are our most important assets. You've heard that in businesses, right? But what do people talk about? They talk about what is most easily measured. They talk about what's on the financial statement. Hey, what about our company? Do we have a mission? Do we have a set of values? Do we have a culture around here? Yeah, they're kind of floating over on the side. Maybe they're on the back of the business card. Maybe they're on a plaque in the lobby. But most companies are spending most of their time talking about numbers. What do you think that does to those engagement figures? When the boss is talking all about the numbers and, oh, man, we didn't hit our numbers and we got to you know, cut down on raises or maybe we need more turnover to get people costs down to hit the numbers, that causes disengagement. This is where your superpowers come in. These are the superpowers you may not know you have as a veteran or an active duty military member in this group. So superpower number one, one of the first things we learn in the military is everybody is a leader, right? Whether you go through boot camp, officer candidate school, any kind of training, it doesn't matter if you're the most junior person on the team, you think of yourself and others look at you as a leader. That means you gotta do your job, you gotta do your job really well, and do what else? Be ready to do somebody else's job. Be ready to step up, take over for the fire team leader if needed, be able to do whatever else the team needs to win. In business, what do typical business people think? Well, to be a leader, you need to have a title. You need to be a president. You need to have a bunch of people reporting to you. Well, we all know in our soul that's not true. So I'm telling you, when you start to think of everybody on your team, again, it might be a four-person team or a hundred-person company, when you start talking to all those people and making sure they understand what you know, and that is leadership is a choice, not a function of position, not a function of title, not a function of how many people you have reporting to you, when you get people to understand that, believe that, buy into it and act accordingly, it changes everything. It literally is a superpower. I'll give you an example. If you come up to the 511 headquarters in Irvine, there's a gentleman named Charles Baskerville, former Navy petty officer. He's got one of the worst jobs at 511. Why? He's at the front desk. He's at the front desk where 130 people come in every day. Sometimes they go out at lunch, they come back after lunch. We have vendors stopping by, we have customers, we have people coming in trying to sell us things we don't need. We have vagrants showing up looking for water, whatever. Charles's job is to inflict and infect all those people with some serious 5.11 culture. Even if it's a salesperson selling us something we don't need. And he creates so much positive energy, he is truly a leader. So that's your first superpower, is that you are a leader, you know how to teach other people to be leaders and think of themselves as leaders. Make sense? All right, the second superpower really comes from an experience I had right before I went to officer candidate school at Quantico. I know I was an officer. All right, get over it. <laughs> get over it. So in my next life, I'm going to come back. I'll enlist first, then be a Mustanger. 
Okay. Yeah. But here's, here's the handicap I had. Both my parents were naval officers. So they are really proud when I got a naval ROTC scholarship. Boy, were they pissed off when I joined the Marine Infantry. <laughs> oh, what, is, what is wrong with you? No thinking person would do that, and I studied physics at Duke. But anyway, I digress. So my backdoor neighbor was George Grabner. George was a badass Marine in Vietnam, two combat tours. And he said to me, he said, you know what, when you go to officer candidate school, guess what? They're going to ask you to do some things that are absolutely ridiculous. They're going to ask you to do things like after they dump your foot locker out for the third or fourth time, they have to put it back together in perfect inspection, you know, dress right dress. They're going to ask you to go clean the head. What's ahead? Shut up. That's the bathroom. They're going to ask you to go clean the head multiple times over and over again. But here's a secret. If you look at every one of those tasks, ridiculous as it might be as a mission, and you rally the team around the mission and attack it with crazy positive energy, guess what? People are going to follow you, if only out of sheer curiosity. Who's that crazy guy who wants to clean the head for the fifth time and make it fun? So your second superpower, and Evan Hafer mentioned this, Donnie O'Malley mentioned this, we learn about everything's a mission in the military. Well, think about business. How often do people talk about the mission in business? In my opinion, not nearly often enough. In the really successful companies, they talk about mission all the time. So I'm going to rebuild Wooden's Pyramid, again, the one I stole. And guess what's at the base of the pyramid? The mission. Now, going back to, I didn't ha have a chance to hear the, the pastor the entire time, but I put it this way. When you go to church, do you think money is important to a church or religious organization? Absolutely. Did you say 10%? 10% off the top. Yeah, so is money important at church? You betcha. So for those who go to church or any kind of religious ceremony, when you walk in the door, are they talking about money? No. What are they doing? Typically singing. Typically talking about things that relate to neighbors and cultures, and they're connecting with people. If you come to one of my meetings, what do you think we do when we walk in? We play music. We talk about what's happening with families. Then the next thing we do is we talk about mission and the culture we're trying to build. And my entire career I've been accused of not being hard enough on people because I always want to talk about mission. I want to talk about mission and I'm going to get to the money later because I'll tell you right now, the soft stuff drives the hard stuff. If you berate people and talk about money all the time and, and I've got almost a photographic memory for numbers so people know they can't BS me on numbers I never start with the numbers any conversation even if I'm dying to walk over to somebody who just missed their operating profit target or their sales goal and I want to choke them out it's like so Charlie how we doing what's going on you know tell me about your team what's the next meeting with the team we're going to talk about things other than the numbers then we'll get to the numbers so in great companies, in the companies that I submit you should be building, always start with the mission. And don't lecture people about the mission. Tell stories about the mission. The best way to get your point across is somebody in your four-person work group or 100-person company is already doing a great job of being purposeful and building culture. Talk about them. The more junior, the better. Even if they've done the wrong thing, the right way, that's the best. Hey, let me tell you a story about Jose in the warehouse or Sally in the warehouse who did a great job trying to serve a customer. It didn't work out so well. But Jose or Sally, what they were doing is spot on with what our company is all about. That's the kind of purposefulness, that's the kind of mission focus we need around here. You want to be on that religious campaign to talk about mission and culture. Then what? You talk about your people. Okay, you know, who's new to the team? What are we doing to train our people? How much are we investing in people's capability? You know, what do you want to do that's unique at your company to make people feel like they're part of that mission? And I like to say, in business, unfortunately, we can't send everybody through boot camp. It'd be nice. You know, some companies do have like Coder Boot Camp and so forth. But a uh, quick story about Panda Express. 
So uh, if you eat too much orange chicken, I'm sorry about that. Stuff's really good. So uh, the short version of the story is Andrew Chern, a billionaire who at the time of the story was 62 years old. Andrew had taken a trip to Taipei. He had really gotten this whole bug. He already had the bug around mission, but he's really getting into training. He comes back and he said, Tom, I went to a restaurant company over in Taipei, and you know what they do every morning? They make their restaurant managers in training run three miles through the streets of Taipei in formation. Can you believe it? I was like, that's cool, man. Hey, I'm a Marine. Group PT, Jody's, running through the streets of Rosemead, California. That's pretty cool. I said, Andrew, HR is going to tell us we can't do it. <laughs> so sure enough, HR has a hundred reasons why you can't make people run. So Andrew Chern, he's a billionaire. He owns the company. He doesn't give a flying you-know-what. He's like figure it out. I'm like, I like that charge. So to reverse engineer around this, I basically tell all the people in the field who are sending their folks in for restaurant manager training, we get like 20 or so in a class, and we'd run a class every month. We had big sprinter vans drive people around. I put the word out, look, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a time in which your people need to run three miles. Don't send them unless they can meet that time. Andrew, you and me, let's go we're going to jog around the park and figure out what the time is. The dude's 62. I don't think he'd ever run. He throws down a 33-minute, not bad for a 62-year-old guy in the restaurant business, 33-minute, three-mile time. Hey, everybody, if your people coming in for restaurant manager training can't run a 33-minute, you know, 11-minute mile for three, don't send them. I'm not making this up. And guess what? People came in. Who was at the front? Andrew. Not me, I would have been at the front, but I was, I was policing everybody up. Who's at the front? The 62-year-old billionaire. Do you think we got sued by anybody? There's some people who I, I suspect may have left the company because they didn't like it, but think of that cultural message. There's some shared sacrifice. People had to train to get ready for it. And look, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, we're not going to make you run the three miles. But that's an example of people are going to tell you all the things you can't do. Hey, you did that in the military. You did that boot camp thing in the military. You had all those shared hardships. I'm telling you right now, if you're thoughtful about it and you lead from the front and you do it yourself, there's a lot you can do out here in the first Civ Div. So that's people. So after people, then you want to talk about product, customer. Oh, my R rolled over. And then ultimately, guess what? We get to the money, right? But we get to the money the long way. Why? Because the soft stuff drives the hard stuff. And by the time I get to the money, hey, we're all on the same team. We're all speaking very frankly with each other. We've been running, hiking, doing whatever. I can be very direct around, hey, I need another two percentage points at that business. Uh, one of my key leaders at Panda would always say, just give me one more percent. One more percent on the revenue line or one more percent at the gross margin line, one more, more percent on the bottom line. Relentless. But you get to the money after you've talked about all of the other things that are important in the business. So let me pull it all together for you in a quick story. So you've got your two superpowers, right? That is, you're a leader. You know everybody else can be a leader, even if they don't have a title or a bunch of people reporting to them. And you know it's important to have a mission and you can bring that mission to life and talk about it all the time and get to the numbers the long way, the sustainable way. So a few years ago, we had done a deal, actually my predecessor had done a deal at 511 with a lawyer who owned a gun range, be careful of those people, lawyer owned a gun range in Central California, and let's say his name was Bill, which it wasn't, but his name was Bill. So my predecessor consigned half a million dollars worth of inventory to this individual bill. In other words, basically gave it to him on credit, no money down, to open the first ever 511 tactical store. Now about half of the product in there were police uniforms. So the store opens, does really well. Unfortunately, this gentleman, Bill, had a stroke. So one of my first duties, having taken over the company, I have to go meet with Bill and his wife. Uh, Bill couldn't really talk. A lawyer owning a gun range who couldn't talk, weird combination. He could kind of waggle a finger at me, 
It's about all he could do. And his wife said, let me translate. We're not paying you. We're going to give you zero dollars for the half million of product you gave us. Ah, so I said to my investors, hey, I got bad news. I got bad news that we're writing off half a million dollars worth of product. And guess what? We're in the retail business. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is 511. We wholesale to dealers who typically sell to police. We are not in the retail direct consumer business at all. Under no circumstances, Tom, will you have that store. Get rid of it. Give it to another dealer. Give it to somebody. So I call our big dealers like Gauls and Keystones and Adamson's. Hey, I got a store, Central Valley, California, making money. Please take it off my hands. My board doesn't want me to have the store. I get, sorry, we don't want a store in the Central Valley. We don't want a store that's only 511 products. That's a dumb idea. Funny, that's what my board said. So I get that from all my, my dealers as well as my board members. So I hire a guy out of Volcom named Jeff Roberts, not a veteran, but I say, Jeff, take over the store. Let's prove that this works. So with my board on my back, don't open another retail store. We decide to open two. <laughs> and we opened two with a bunch of military veterans. We opened one in Riverside, uh, right near the big mall out in Riverside. And then we went to Las Vegas. And I said to Jeff, I don't want to pay a lot in rent because these things cannot lose money. They can do low sales, but they cannot fail. They cannot lose money. So Jeff come, comes back, he says, I have a perfect site. It's off the I-15. It's on the west side of the street, facing east, looking at the back of the Bellagio. Some of you may have seen this store. I look at the site, and the name on the building when Jeff brings me the deal is Las Vegas Stripper University. I'm like, dude, are you kidding? He goes, yeah, they went out of business. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's highly visible. A lot of traffic on the I-15. What's the rent? For 5,000 square feet, it's four grand a month. I'm like, dude, that works. We can make that work. So we opened those two stores. The Las Vegas store now does $3 million a year. Again, you can do the math, right? 4,000 times 12, 48 grand is all we pay in rent. So we're paying like 2% in rent. But the punchline of the story is everybody went into that retail division working for me and Jeff thinking, I'm a leader, I can make a difference, I represent the brand. We bring the catalog to life in the retail stores and we have a mission. And that mission is very important. That's all we talk about at retail and the numbers have followed. So the soft stuff drives the hard stuff. You have two superpowers. You know you're a leader, help others discover that they too are leaders, even if they don't have anybody reporting to them. And mission, mission is what it's all about. You know that, and you don't have to walk out there and tell people, hey, I've got superpowers. Show them you have superpowers. You know, bring that mission to life. And when somebody says, are we talking about the mission again? Are you telling one more story about the mission? You say, yes, I am. Let's bring it on. Or better yet, when they say, are you telling another story about the mission? You say, Rudy, it's your turn to talk about somebody on the team who lives our mission. What do you got for me? Or maybe give them a day's notice so you don't embarrass them in front of everybody. But that's the bottom line. And I will wrap by saying, we have a lot of fun too. That's uh, one of my favorite photos, Josh Bridges, Navy SEAL. He just won the Murph competition at the CrossFit Games a couple years ago. So we're making some pretty cool play carriers. So God bless you. Thanks, everybody. Fun to be here. Chris, are we done? Chris, how are we on time? Am I done, or we got time for a question or two? We got time for questions. All right, fire it up. All right, who wants to ask the first question? Anybody here in the crowd? We'll and yes, we did paint the poles at Las Vegas Stripper University. <laughs> They're still there. They're black. It's crazy. Oh, we got somebody right here. Okay. Simplify, Tom. Hoorah. One thing that I have a, as a veteran-owned business is in Encinitas, where I live, I'm often called very passionate. That's code word for you drive too hard, you talk too much, you know, you're so doing what you're doing. How do I bo bottle that beast just a little bit so I don't scare people away? And so everybody hear the question? And I would ask, is that your wife telling you that? Or is that people on your team? You know, my team consists of me and me 
and then okay. me and then four other yeah. people that are just like just me but no when i'm approaching individuals right. when i'm talking to individuals about wellness about yes. you know leadership and that we're all leaders right. they're saying dude this is not the marine corps i go yeah. but you know what I know it's not the Marine Corps, but as I'm speaking to you right now, I'd like for us to have a common goal, and that goal is to really try to do something a little bit better. And they say, oh, dude, but you know, you do this. It's, I'm trying to convince too many people. Should I just move on or find the people that are listening? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that's a bit of a marketing question, but I think the general theme can be sometimes you get feedback that, hey, you're a little too hardcore, you're a little too enthusiastic, whatever the case may be. My advice is own it. Do not tone it down on your end. But self-deprecating humor is a great leveler. So sometimes, and, and I do this with people, it's like, I'm a little crazy. If somebody's going to join the company, we've gone through the whole process, they're excited to join Panda 511, whatever, then I'll say, whoa, 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 hang on. You're all excited. Let me tell you something. We're crazy around here. We hike, we run, we do a lot of stuff. We're really enthusiastic. If work needs to get done, we stay late, we come in early. This is not for everybody. I'm telling you, this is dangerous before you sign up for the mission. So you can kind of make fun of yourself. And you did that, you and I met when I came in. You're like, I'm a little crazy. Look at all the 511 stuff I'm wearing. I think it works for you. So if people are telling you to tone it down, my view is don't be impolite, don't be rude, but don't tone it down. You gotta be you. You got to own it. All right. All right. Next question. Somebody in the back, you want to step up? Sir, how are you? I'm Zach Bostic, Ra. Zach, nice to meet you. Looking back now to the days that you took over 511, what is one piece of advice that you wish you could have given yourself looking back? Yeah, so uh, it's the old, what would you have done differently? I, I would say, uh, you know, when you take over an organization, a little different than building an organization. So uh, I probably could have changed out more people sooner. So back to that distribution curve of 23 out of 100 are fully engaged. I'm here, boss. I'm fired up. What are we doing today to make the world a better place? So the people in the middle, the 50-ish percent who maybe aren't engaged but might move over, you've got to figure out pretty quickly who's on the team. And again, you don't want to be rude to folks, but there are going to be certain people who are just not going to get better. So moving faster on upgrading talent. And I would say, again, if you're in that small company with three other people, you want to give folks the benefit of the doubt. But at some point, if you know in your heart they're not going to get it, they're not going to come around, you've got to upgrade. Because unless you can delegate and depend on your team, the days get really long and hard. You know, and I hear people say, I've never fired somebody too early. I've always waited till I don't really believe that. But when you know somebody's not going to improve, you've got to make a move. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we have one more question? I think we're done. Let's go, Chris. All right. Come on. Thank you so much.